Well, I hope that uh, things are working well. Um, do you have any questions before we get started? Okay, this is the first time we are trying to use bright space to disseminate some of the materials in this course. And this is also the first time we are using Piazza. Have you, any one of you used Piazza on bright space? Are you happy with the response? I asked my TA Ivan to answer all the questions. So he has been answering the questions well. Then. Okay, we're happy with them. Okay, wonderful. So let me do a roll call. Muhammad Hassan, no. Alena Akanasio, okay. Muna Awajan, Muna. Uh, Saleh Basama, Ravin Shanka, Colin Brown. Yuhan Chen, Travis Crawford, David Wonki, Tao Evans, Zhe Donghu, Jabi Bin Jahan Yale, Thomas Canal, good. Christopher Len uh, Lackney. Christopher Lackney. Yu Teng Lee. Geoffrey Macri Sanchez. Good. Mira Marinona. Um, uh, Marinova. Good. Logan Bellican. Sophie Thompson Payne. Ryan Schneider, good. Bukum Han, thank you. Brendan Triplett, thank you. Hao Xuan Wang, Jie Wang, Jie, Yue Hua Wu, Zi Yi Yan, Joseph Zulo. No? Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, let's get started. Uh, you're going to talk about material properties and more on constitutive relationship, which is something quite important for this course and to understand material properties around us. Okay, so the topic would be more on constitutive relations. As we said before, uh, the first two of Maxwell's equations are not enough to solve for all the unknowns we have in Maxwell's equation E, H, B, and D. So we need the constitutive relationship because we have E, H, B, and D. Uh, we only have two Maxwell's equations for the first two. The third and fourth are dependent on the first two and they're not sufficient to solve for all the unknowns we have because the first two Maxwell's equations are set, as you recall. And then curl of H is dd dt plus j. Um, so usually we assume the input to the system, the input to the system is the curve. Okay, this will be the outputs. But then we have two equations and four output unknowns. So we need constitutive relationship as additional equation for vacuum. It is very simple that the electric flux is related to the electric field in this manner. The magnetic flux is related to the magnetic field in this manner. Let me see if we can make this pen thicker. Hopefully, this will, go. This will make it thicker. Okay. And um, so, in addition, we have material properties, and usually D 
is just not epsilon naught E, which is the vacuum contribution to the displacement. Uh, we need a contribution from the material medium, which is called the polarization density, that is called P. Okay. In general, this P together with these two terms on the right hand side give rise to what we call displacement curve. Okay, um, this is of course what we call polarization density. And this is the vacuum contribution. Okay, this is the vacuum contribution to the displacement plus P. Um, so for linear medium, we can write P in a very simple fashion. So P is proportional to E. P are due to polarization density. They are actually a consequence of small little dipoles in the material medium. And these little dipoles uh, will get polarized by the electric field. For instance, if I have a material medium, they are made from molecules. And you can think of each molecule has been polar, polar molecules, so that if you apply an electric field, these polar molecules will align themselves and they become little dipoles, and they give rise to P, the polarization density. The dipoles or the polarization density is proportional to epsilon naught, let's call it chi E, E. Okay, we say it is really, linearly proportional to E in this manner. We do not know what chi E is. And chi E will be dependent on the material that you're looking at. And uh, so if you look at the displacement current, it will be coming from both of these terms. And then D would be equal to, as you can see from here, epsilon E plus epsilon naught chi E E. And then what you have is that the thing can be written as one plus chi e e. And this is usually called electric susceptibility, named to, to spell and I hope I spell it correctly. Okay, chi sub e is called electric susceptibility. And so this is something that characterizes what the linear medium is. So in the linear medium, you can think of having the polarization density as the output. Okay, polarization density. And that polarization density uh, is dependent on the input. And this is my input. Okay. In general, we can assume the system to be linear so that P is linearly proportional to E. But that may not necessarily be the case. P can non linearly depend on E, but for simplicity, we we'll assume a linear relationship. And you can think of a medium as being consisting of polar molecules. Okay, like H2O is a polar molecule. H2O, uh, if you remember your uh, chemistry well, consists of an oxygen and two hydrogen atoms. And the, if I recall my chemistry well, I think the hydrogen tends to become positive, positive, and the oxygen tends to become negative. So together they form a dipole. And then when you apply the electric field to this molecule, the dipole will follow the direction of the electric field. Very much like the picture I've shown here. So the dipoles will align themselves in the direction of the electric field. And then currents, a kind of current will flow through vacuum or through space. This current is called the displacement current. And you can think of this as being liking 
a capacitive coupling in space. Okay, if you think of this as a whole bunch of capacitors connected in series. You know that if the current is connected in such a fashion, it cannot send a DC current or static current through this capacitor. However, you can get current to flow. You can get current to flow back and forth if you send in an AC current. So if you start to polarize this medium with an alternating electric field, then displacement current will start to flow. Okay, that's why displacement current is proportional to like when we have Maxwell's equation, we have this term. Displacement current is proportional to the change of the electric flux, whereas electric current may not be. Okay, as you have seen before, in a conductive medium, J is just sigma E. But in a resistive medium or an insulator, the current has to be proportional to the time rate of change of the electric flux, very much like how currents would flow through a capacitor. Okay. So one thing that you have to know, which is that this is a linear relationship, but not the most general one. You can have more general relationship, for instance, that P as a function of time at the position R can be linearly related to the electric field in this manner through a convolution. So you know that the input is E, the output is P. And what do we call this in electrical engineering for a linear system? What do we call that in electrical engineering? Transfer function, right? A transfer function of a linear system that we learn a lot in electrical engineering, especially in circuit theory. So the most general relationship between E and P is through a convolution, like in a linear time invariant system, LTI system. This is a convolution. And this is just be a transfer function. Okay, so having known that, then what we have is that, but this convolution can be easily simplified in the frequency domain, as you have seen in your circuit theory analysis courses. All the inductors, all the capacitors in the time domain, they're very cumbersome to analyze, but when you once you transfer them. To the frequency domain, inductors and capacitors become a piece of cake. Okay, so in general, in the frequency domain, if something is a convolution in the time domain, in the frequency domain, it remains to be a linear relationship in this manner, just a multiplication. Convolution becomes a multiplication in the frequency domain or using phase, uh, phase techniques. So, this is wonderful. A lot of complicated things become extremely simple in the frequency domain or using phase technique. So in general, if we have an electric flux in the frequency domain, then it would be epsilon E in the frequency domain. Usually I wouldn't write omega there, but for just this time I will write omega for you. Okay, next time I won't write omega for you. But when you see that omega there, it means that we're in the frequency domain. And usually it's implied. Lots of things in science and engineering are implied. So from the context, you know that these things are in the frequency domain. And then if you write this out properly, then it should be epsilon naught one plus chi r omega e. Okay, if I plug in the previous expression that I have, um, which is in the previous slide. Okay, if I plug this in, this was written not telling you what domain I was in, 
we just assume that we have the simplest of system there, okay? But if you go through the thought processes and repeat this in the frequency domain, it should rightfully be something like this, okay? And hence, you can also write this as being epsilon r of omega, e of r of omega, okay? And this is usually called, this thing being this thing together is usually called effective permittivity of the medium. Okay, we'll learn very soon that this should be a function of frequency. So epsilon is a function of frequency and we call this uh, being frequency dispersive. And when epsilon is a function of position and frequency, we call this in homogeneous or heterogeneous. Okay, so using frequency domain and phasor technique, we can characterize very many media, and we can even characterize what something that is even more complicated than that called it an isotropic medium, okay? In the in isotropic medium case, what happens is that P is epsilon E plus P, but P is not related to E in the simple fashion like we have done before, but related to E through a matrix chi dot E. Okay, chi dot E. Chi is the three by three matrix. This is a three by three matrix. And a matrix that relates to physical quantity is usually called a tensor. Okay, it's just another form of matrix, but a, a mathematician would never call this matrices tensor, but physicists will call their matrices when they're three by three. And when they are relating physical quantities, we call them tensors. They can be related uh, four by four vectors as well. Okay, but this is for a tensor. Okay, and so in general, if you lump these two together, you will have a tensor epsilon e times e. And you see that when you lump them together, you have this relationship. So because epsilon is in general a tensor, which could be frequency dispersive, it can be written as a three by three matrix, but the simplest one would be something that you often see in optics, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, in zero, zero. This is the simplest kind of tensor that is encountered pretty frequently in optics, those are either called uniaxial medium or biaxial medium. Okay, so when epsilon one is not equal to epsilon two, is not equal to epsilon three, this medium is called biaxial. However, epsilon equals epsilon two, not equal to epsilon three, we call it uniaxial. Okay. The characteristic about tensors is that if you have an electric field, if the electric field is pointing in that direction, the resulting D does it need to point in the same direction as E if the relationship between them is a tensor? No, right? No. But what happens if the medium is uniaxial? Would D and E still point in the same direction? Yes or no? No, right? Because epsilon one epsilon two, epsilon three are, three are different. If you imagine a three component vector in space, the three, one of the three components would be supposed to scale in the wrong direction and the D will not be pointing in the same direction as E, okay? So both uniaxial by X and a general tensor medium, the D that you have do not point in the same direction as your E. Okay, that is the hallmark of uh, an isotropic medium. 
So let's go to a simpler medium that you have around you all the time, which is a conductive medium. Well, in the conductive medium, we say that the current there is just that in one of Maxwell's equations. And if you want to be fancier, you can say that the sigma, the conductivity itself, can also be a tensor, conductivity tensor. And this is often found in a good earth. Okay, if you are an explorational geophysicist, you'll find that the earth itself is a conductor. And the conductor is quite complicated because the earth is layered due to geographical formations. Currents tend to flow in the preferred direction. And the sigma that you have of the good earth is usually a tensor. Okay. So if you were to put this into Maxwell's equation, Maxwell's equation has the displacement current, which I already discussed. But then if you have a J, okay, which is a conductive medium, J would appear in this form. And since the right-hand side is all linearly proportional to E, we can rewrite the right-hand side so that it can be written as, uh, sorry, I should write J. Just I'm mixed up because I'm between optics and electromagnetics. If you're a microwave engineer, always use J. If you're an optics guy, you always use I. And if you talk to physicists and the mathematicians, you always use I for imaginary number. But if you talk to an electrical engineer who is low frequency, he works in a circuits lab, he works in a microwave lab, he uses J. Okay? And also, K is omega mu epsilon for most of us, but sometimes beta is used for this constant. The wave number has been notated differently in different communities. So, so if I were to write this in this manner, so you can see that I can lump the two things together. I can lump the two terms together since both of them are linearly proportional to E and I can lump them together and write the right hand side as such. And so if I were to notate this as a complex number, which I call a complex permittivity, I use under tilde to denote a complex permittivity at this point, then the right hand side is just equal to that. So the wonderful thing about this is that this equation that you have for a conductive medium is of the same form as the equation for a non-conductive medium. Can you see the two equations are essentially the same. You replace epsilon with epsilon under tilde. Then you can use that to model mathematically a conductive medium. This I call homomorphism even though some people don't like it. <clears throat> so if you have experience in computer science, there's something called homomorphic computing or homomorphic encryption. Which means that if you were starting to write codes in one thing, there is a mapping. It actually maps out a set of codes that is encrypted and undecipherable to your good eyes. Okay, those are called homomorphic computing or homomorphic encryption. The machine does it for you, but it's just a mapping. The mapping means that everything that is to the left maps to something that is to the right. So I can see that the two equations or homomorphic to each other in the sense that the complex permittivity maps to the real permittivity I had previously found. So whatever I did for real permittivity, I can also use that for 
complex permittivity. Okay, so this is what I call and this is also that okay, complex permittivity. Um so this is a wonderful thing because you know that the algebra, the algebra of real numbers is the same as the algebra of complex numbers, right? Whatever you know to do with real numbers, you know to do with complex numbers, except for the detail. Like one over X or one over C is different if you have real number or if you have a complex number, but algebra is the same. The rules of algebra are the same for them. So whatever you do for complex numbers also work for real numbers and vice versa. So in general, um, the, this is a re linear relationship, but you can have, have more general relationships that I will not talk about. You can have convolution relationship uh, as well, which I will not talk about. You can read about it in the lecture notes. Okay, and then and then in general, the relationship between P and E is a something that looks like this. Okay, but you can have something fancier than this. You can have the fact that uh, in addition to a convolution in time, because in the time domain, this would give rise to a convolution in time. Okay. You can also take Fourier transform. So to, to get between convolution in time in the frequency domain, all electrical engineers say we just use phaser technique. But if you talk to a mathematician, you say you use Fourier transform. You use a Fourier transform to convert between a product, multiplicative product to a convolution. But you can do likewise for space. Say if I have a if I have a very complicated relationship, and if I take it to the Fourier space in both time and space. And this might appear to be something like this. Okay. Then if I work backward, this will be a double convolution in both time and space. Okay. So if I were to write this in the space domain, it would be something rather complicated. Uh, then you have to convolve in both maybe something. I, I'm, I don't know if I use the right notation for that. You have to do a double convolution for both time and space. And then you can get rid of the space dependence of the some of these problems as well. So a, a problem or a medium where the permittivity and the chi is dependent on space as well. That is called uh, spatially dispersive. Okay, if it depends on omega only, this is called frequency dispersive. And let me see. Yeah, and if it depends on R, of course, we say that it is in homogeneous or heterogeneous. Okay. We have also other possibilities like nonlinear media. If we have a nonlinear medium which occurs quite frequently in two areas, one area is in optics. Optical people have to deal with nonlinear media all the time because the wavelength is very short. So a small number of perturbation, a small perturbation will cause the phase velocity to change. 
And that can be sensed quite easily in optical experiments. Another place where you have nonlinear medium is in electrical machinery. Because when you have a permeability mu and you want to get the magnetic flux B to be proportional to H and the relationship between B and H in the electrical machinery is usually nonlinear. Okay. Because that's how things are made. And I wrote a little bit more about it in the uh, lecture notes. You can look at that. So in general, we have this kind of relationship that P is linearly proportional to E. Uh, you can have this to be even more complicated. It can be something like this. And then you can have chi itself is dependent on the input. Okay. If the transfer function depends on the input, that is a no-no for linear time invariant system. All electrical engineers would throw up their hand and say, this is too complicated for me. I like to deal with linear time invariant system where the transfer function is not dependent on the input. So if you have a system where the transfer function chi is dependent on the input E, you have a nonlinear system in your hands. Okay, that is a no-no. And this frequently uh, occurs in optics. For instance, the Kerr effect, which is something quite well-known, is of Observed in optics, maybe 1875, I don't know, just an approximate date, okay? In the, in the previous century, that's all I know. And if you have a magnetic material, uh, B is mu naught H, and in general, B is mu H for a linear medium. But if you have a nonlinear medium, you will have the mu being a function of H as well. Okay, this is manifestly nonlinear. So if you were to draw a picture, I think I have a picture here. Yeah. So if you were to draw a picture of the B versus H, So if you were to draw the function of B as a function of H for a linear medium, it will be a straight line because for a linear medium, B is linearly proportional to H. So as you increase H, B increases by the same amount. Like if you double H, B doubles. If you triple H, B triples. But if you have a nonlinear medium, you have to indicate it with such a curve that if you double H, which is a horizontal axis, you do not double B. And you encounter this in an electrical machinery quite frequently. The detail of physics is because they have domains in the magnetic material. So it's not easy to polarize those magnetic domains inside a magnetic material. And as you polarize that material, it goes like this in the curve and then it comes back having some memory as to where it has gone. So it does not go back to its original place and it forms what is called a hysteresis loop. Okay. Hysteresis loop. And the power engineer worries about this loop quite a bit because you can show that as you polarize the magnetic material in an electrical machinery, you take energy to polarize it and to unpolarize it the energy expanded in polarizing that magnetic material is proportional to the area of the hysteresis loop. So for a linear medium, the area is zero, but for a nonlinear medium, that area is not zero. And that is where the dissipated energy goes. Um, it's usually written up in most uh, books in electrical machinery. So I wouldn't go into it in detail, but uh, let's move on to something more interesting. Let's see that we have a constitutive relationship we studied for many media. And let's take the simplest of all media, the homogeneous medium. Okay, and see 
what kind of wave do we see? Can we see wave phenomenon? We have seen wave phenomenon for vacuum. A few lectures back to show that if you have vacuum, you have Maxwell's equations, you can derive an equation from what called the wave equation, and you see wave phenomenon. Let's see if we can do the same thing here. So let's study wave phenomenon. Okay. So, and let's assume that uh, the medium is source free. So we are like in free space, homogeneous medium. Okay, not necessarily free space, but it can be the good earth. Good earth is not usually homogeneous, but let's assume that it is homogeneous enough, or maybe you're in the ocean, in the middle of the ocean. Ocean is quite homogeneous, right? Things don't change very much until you meet the shark. Right? So it's quite homogeneous. So if that is the case, then curl of E, It's just J omega mu naught E if it's homogeneous, we can say that this is just mu naught H. Okay. And then curl of H is just minus J omega epsilon E. Okay. For a homogeneous medium, this is true. And then we can actually take the curl of the first equation, okay, and arrive at this equation, assuming that mu is a constant. Okay, mu is a constant. Yes. Because you sign the equation on the right hand side, it doesn't make sense. Let me think. I have to think a little bit because I work between minus i and j. Uh, you're right. Okay, this is for the optic sky. For the microwave sky, it should be backwards. Okay, so you take the curl of the first equation, you get this one. Thank you for pointing that out. You get that thing, and then you make use of the second equation. You make use of the second equation to take care of what curl of E should be on the right hand side. And then you will have. Um, Right hand side becoming omega square mu not uh, mu epsilon e. Okay, you will have that. And again, you use something to simplify curl of curl of e. And you should be a pro at this at this point. You will always have to simplify curl of curl of e until you get tired of it, or you can do it in your sleep. So what is curl of curl of e? You have to memorize your back of the cat formula and apply the back of the cat formula, and you can do it upside down. Okay, and what should that be equal to? What is curl of curl of E? Nobody knows. That's amazing. Or okay. that's surprising. You should know. Um, this, uh, the gradient of the dot of the mean minus the Laplacian. Yeah, gradient of this. Okay, we call it the divergence of the divergence. Yeah, gradient of the divergence of E minus the Laplacian of E. Okay, if you use the back of the cat formula, you get this. And this usually we call it the Laplacian. Okay, so but. Because we are in the source free homogeneous medium, you can assume that divergence of E is equal to zero because uh, divergence of P equal to zero. And if it's homogeneous, this is epsilon E is equal to zero. And if epsilon is a constant, this implies divergence of E equal to zero. Okay. So this equation that we spend some effort deriving becomes simpler. It becomes simpler because uh, the double curl on the left-hand side disappears. And then what we have is actually, uh, let me just write it down. Okay. 
Okay. So this is almost like the wave equation, but this equation is in the frequency domain. It is the analog of the wave equation that you saw a few lectures back. This equation in the frequency domain is called the ham hops equation or the ham hops wave equation. Okay, ham hop equation. Okay, so let's look for solutions to this ham hops wave equation then. Uh, let's see how we get here. We get here by assuming the divergence of E equal to zero. So we have to obey that criteria that we have used. So we can imagine something very, very simple. So let's think of the simpler way that divergence of E can be zero and E can be like this, I, I think so, yeah. E can be no more time, okay, being the frequency domain, no more time dependence, but E is a function of frequency, it's a phasor. So let it be dependent only on Z, but pointing in the X direction. You can see that divergence of E equal to zero, can't you? You take divergence of E for this particular quantity. Uh, this is automatically satisfied. And now, if you were to plug this simplification back into the Helmholtz wave equation, what happens to the Laplacian? Laplacian on this greatly simplified quantity becomes what? Laplacian becomes, yes? Somebody wants to answer? What happens to partial square, partial x square, the Laplacian? The Laplacian, remember, is partial square, partial x square, plus partial square, partial y square, plus partial square, partial z square. But only one of the three remain. Which one of the three? Partial square, partial z, partial x square, partial y square, all disappear. Because I'm assuming a very simplified solution that has only z dependence. So this Helmholtz wave equation becomes actually an ordinary differential equation because it only has one derivative now. Okay. The k a square is omega square mu epsilon. It's usually called a wave number. Okay, and some people use beta square for this, depending on whether you're talking to an optics guy or if you're talking to a microwave engineer. So this is an ODE, second order ODE that electrical engineers have solved over and over again. What are the solutions to this ODE, second order ODE? Anybody? <coughs> Maybe it's Sui since he's always answering questions. What about you? Exponential, right? Exponential to what? Very good, you got one of the two terms correct. What is the other one? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you a hard time, okay? Let me write it down for you. So the general solution for EX, Z, would be something like E0 plus E to the minus J, K, Z, plus E0 minus E to the plus, KKZ, right? They're just two solutions. You can write these two solutions in terms of exponential functions, and you can write them in terms of sine and cosine. But in this case, it is a lot more pleasant to write them in terms of exponential functions because they have different physical meanings. What you should remember is that once you have a second order ODE, second, okay, second order ODE is very important. You will have two independent solutions. You can take any two solutions that are independent. You form a complete set to the solution of the second order OD. So you can take two exponential functions and take sines and cosines that are independent of each other. You can also take one sine and one exponent independent of each other. So any two, but there are many possibilities. So if you were to wanting to go back to the 
time domain. This is assuming a time harmonic sigma. How would I take this function back to the time domain? What is the rule of thumb? What is the machinery that you have to crank to get this expression back to the time domain? It's just the machinery you put, you know, mindset in that machinery, you just crank the machinery, so you can get back the time domain version of this expression. What do you do to get this back to the time domain? Yes? The real component of it. What else must you do? Taking the real component of this does not do the job. To go from frequency domain back to the time domain, that is a mathematician thesis this way. What about if you're a poor man, like an engineer? What? Phases. phases, very good. So how do you convert phases in the frequency domain back to the time domain? Yes? You use that like sine cosine law? Yes, you use that law a bit, but there's one simple rule of thumb that you have to always remember uh, that you do to go from frequency domain back to the time domain. Are you WD? Okay, what about what must you do in order to go back from the frequency domain back to the time domain? I think everybody says something, but you don't have a complete picture. Sure. Not sure. Okay, who, who has a sure answer? Who raise his hands high and say, sure, uh, there's no time component so far, right? So if you have to multiply by uh, E, J, omega, T. Okay, you multiply by e to the j omega t and take its real part. Okay, that is the simple rule of thumb that you should never, never forget as an electrical engineer. You take the phaser in the frequency domain, which is a complex quantity. This is very important. But you multiply by this and you take its real part. That is the, the gist of the phaser technique. And you, of course, use the Euler's formula in order to do that. You get the cosine of the whole thing. Okay, so somebody who said Euler's formula, that was correct too. So you get something like sine and cosine too. So it's somewhere buried in there, but things are a lot more complicated and more interesting than that. Okay, let's look at the case of the Uniform plane wave. So we have the Helmholtz equation. We actually started out with Maxwell's equation, and we arrive at this equation that looks something like this. Okay. Before we did any simplification, so we looked at this equation. And we did simplification to it, we arrive at this equation. And you can actually get quite a bit of things from just uh, looking at the equations in its original form before you do simplification, before you use the back of the cap formula. So source free, so we don't have any sources in this problem. So this is. The wave equation, sometimes this is called a vector wave equation. Vector Helmholtz wave equation. Okay. And if you assume that the solution is like a wave, a wave propagating in all directions e to the minus j k x x minus j k y y minus j k z z 
And if the solution is something of this form, exponential form, oscillating in the x direction, oscillating in the y direction, oscillating in the z direction, but oscillating as an exponential function. So this is the hallmark of a wave. And this is how a wave should look like. And you can write it more concisely or more succinctly using a shorthand notation. Okay, the whole thing in the exponent can be written as the dot product of two vectors, where the first vector is this vector. The second vector is the position vector. We call the first vector we call the k vector or the wave vector. The second one is the position vector, it's drifting away in the white shapes. Okay, so you, everything can be written in a concise fashion, but the wonderful thing is that uh, once you actually have this thing and you plug it back, and as you can see, this actually simplifies to this equation. I think the written away. If this equation, and then if you have the Laplacian operating on a function like this, can you easily see that this Laplacian, which is partial square, partial x square, plus partial partial y square, plus partial square, partial z square. E, okay, if E is of that form, can you see that partial square, partial x square? When differentiating that complicated looking expression with this bring down jkx two times. Okay, it will just bring down jkx two times, maybe just become minus kx square minus ky square minus kz square e. Can you see that this is the case? Partial square, partial x squared becomes minus kx square, partial square, partial y squared becomes minus ky square if there's something of that form, okay? And then uh, partial square, partial z squared becomes that. And that has to be equal to this equation, okay, which is equal to minus omega square mu epsilon e. And we can call this k square minus k square. Okay, we defined that somewhere earlier. So you have this relationship, which is quite important. So if you assume a solution of something like this, the k vector, which is called a wave vector, will have x, y, z components. And the x, y, z components have to be such that k, x squared plus k, y squared plus k, z squared is k squared. So think of this as a equation of three variables. Ordinarily, in your high school days, we think of them as x, y, and z. But you have to be more imaginative here to think of the three variables as kx, ky, and kz. What does this equation describe? Yes? Distance squared. Or what? Distance squared. Distance squared. It's like the mean of distance. Yeah, it's true. It's the, it's the, it's the distance. Um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, for instance, is the distance between two points. But if you need x squared plus y squared plus z squared to be a constant, what does that equation describe? The sphere, very good, okay. So this is the equation of a sphere, but in the kx, ky, and kz space, very good, thank you. So in the, these three dimensions of wave numbers, it is an equation of the sphere. And all the, K vectors that you have found have to have this relationship, and this is called the dispersion relationship.
So what, what is more interesting is that um, if you write this thing in this manner, this k dot r is the phase of the exponential term, okay? Phase of the exponential term. And if you demand the phase to be a constant, you will have this picture in your head that if k dot r is a constant, and you will have this picture I show on the bottom left side. K is a vector, a wave vector that points in the K direction. Okay, let me blow this up. K is a vector that points in the K direction and can be arbitrary. You can pick any K, X, K, Y, and K, Z that you want. Say for the fact that it has to be on a sphere. K, X squared plus K, Y squared plus K, Z squared must be a constant or K squared, okay? You can pick K to be anything except that it has to be part of a sphere, okay? And then say if you imagine K dot R is a constant, which is that thing I have in exponent K. Can you see that all the positions that make up R lies on the surface if it's orthogonal to K? Can you see that geometrically? That is, if I pick an R, that is on that orthogonal surface to k. Okay, k dot r must be a constant. Can you see that? You just have to invoke some high school geometry. Okay. So k dot r is a constant defines what is called a constant phase term. So if you have this equation, okay, k dot r equal to different constants define different phase term. So if I were to repeat the equation and pick the constant to be different, the equation of constant phase front defines those surfaces. Those are the phase front for a plane wave. You can imagine a plane wave propagating in a K direction and it will be equal phase on those surfaces. And that surfaces orthogonal to the vector k. Okay, there's something that you should know. And then another thing that you should know is that um, so are there any questions so far? So another thing that you should know is that um, the E, H, and k we have a k vector that we have defined. We just take an arbitrary e and put in the equation. And then you'll find that there's an h that goes with e. And all three of them form a right-handed orthogonal system in this manner. h points out of the blackboard, e points that way. And e and h are both orthogonal to k. Let's see how we can see this, OK? So we go back to Maxwell's equations for both free homogeneous medium again, okay? So we have this equation. Let's assume that uh, it's back here, okay? And then, um, Get my sign wrong, right? Could be this way. Okay. So one thing you notice is that if you have a co operator, co operator is in fact just x partial partial x, x hat, sorry, plus y hat partial partial y, plus z hat partial partial z. And if your e is proportional to e naught e to the minus j k dot r, which is a shorthand notation for that ugly thing is in the exponent. Okay, this is a succinct and elegant way to write the thing in the exponent. And can you see that whenever you have this del operator operating on an exponential function that is that simple, this del operator will just become a j k x minus y. J, K, Y minus D, 
jkz. Can you see that? Okay, partial partial x this become minus jkx, partial partial y to become minus jky, partial partial z. So if you're dealing with plane wave, which is the bottom equation that I have in this slide, the del operator becomes very simple. It just becomes equal to minus j. Maybe I just write it down in one shot. I won't go through the detail with you. It's just minus j times the k vector. Okay, if you reassemble everything together, the right hand side is just minus k times the k vector. So that gives us a very simple rule of thumb. Place derivative with the dial operator is just replaced with a k vector times minus k. Just like in the time domain, whenever we have a time derivative, we just replace that with j omega. But now we have a three dimensional derivative, we just replace that with a minus jk. So Maxwell's equations just becomes like. I don't know why things are tricky. Thank you. So, let me see. So, what happens is that Maxwell's equations just becomes like the first one, just becomes um, minus j k plus e is to the minus j omega mu naught h. And the second Maxwell's equation just becomes minus j k cross h is minus or plus j omega epsilon e. Okay, k is a vector that points in that direction, arbitrary direction, except that kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared must be k squared. That is the distortion relation. If you use the right hand rule, okay, can you see in your mind that E, H, and K are orthogonal to each other? Okay, maybe it's not easy to see yet. Maybe I, I can do this. I can say, uh, cross this equation with K. So if I do that, I will have K cross K cross E is minus j omega mu naught k cross h. Okay. Um, and then this would be equal to omega square mu naught epsilon naught e. Uh, Um, okay, the best way to see that K is orthogonal to E is this, okay? That uh, you, take, you take this equation and dot over with K, okay? But you take this equation and dot over with K. What happens to the left-hand side when you dot the left-hand side with K? Take the second last equation dot with k. What happens to the left hand side? Zero, right? So the right hand side just k dot e. So this equation implies that k dot e must be zero. So the e field must be orthogonal to k. Okay, and then you take the other equation. It says that if you know your e field, that the second the third last equation, if you know the E field, you cross that with K, you get the H field. So E and H must be something. Okay, I better make sure that I get it right. H is orthogonal to both E and K, but should it point out of the paper or into the paper? I do not know, I lost the train of my thought when you have too many cross product. I have to play with it. But what is the sanity check that you should use here to make sure that you pick your H in the right direction? Anybody? Yes? Could you use the right hand rule? E cross H. 
Yeah, so should H be pointing in where? Into the paper or out of the paper? Into the paper, very good. That's what I got to, okay? So I should draw the back side of an arrow. Here's my H. Another thing that you should know is that E cross H, what is the physical meaning of E cross H? We learned that a few lectures back. It's power flow, right? So if the wave is propagating in the K direction, E cross H must be pointing in the same direction as the direction of the wave propagation. So if you go through the detail, I'm sure it's pointing into the paper. If you can keep track of all the cross product, but a sanity check is that E cross H must point in the direction of power flow and hence in the direction of wave propagation. Okay. And you can also further work out that uh, the ratio between E and H can be derived. Let me see. Here. Okay, I, I won't do it. I won't do it anymore, but I I just let you read the lecture notes you'll find that H is epsilon mod mu E. Okay, in other words, you can define an intrinsic impedance, which is thick. Okay, that can be worked out from the algebra. But I'd like to move on to a new topic before we end the lecture, which is the case of the conductive medium. Okay, let's go to the case of the conductive medium. The new, the new slide. Okay. So let's talk about conductive medium. Conductive medium is very important, as I said before. The earth is a lossy medium, a conductive medium. Metal. Like you have in your induction cocoa at home, it's a loss, it's a conducting medium or lossy medium. The ocean, the a lot of things in this world, okay, are conductive. So let's look at Maxwell's equation with a conductive medium. And the J just becomes that. And the wonderful thing is that just like the case of the polarizable medium. Uh, the conduction current is also linearly proportional to, to the electric field. So I can write this equation as J sigma over omega. So I'm just doing a complex algebra quickly. Can you see that the second equation is just the same as the first equation? The advantage of writing the second equation that way is that this is just a number. Okay, this is just a number, of, and this number makes that uh, equation for a conductive medium be no different from the equation for an insulating medium. So well, they're the same. And so what happens there is that uh, just like what I did for homogeneous medium, I can also assume that the The solution is something of that form because the solution is homomorphic to that. I would arrive after some manipulation that the electric field must satisfy this equation for a homogeneous conductive medium, except that this is complex. Okay, I did that for a homogeneous medium, but now if I replace that homogeneous medium with a conductive medium, the only thing I need to do is to replace the epsilon with epsilon under tilde. Okay, where epsilon under tilde is a complex number. And you go through the same algebra again, you will also arrive at the fact that kx square plus ky square plus kz square must be equal to k square, but k square now is a complex number. 
Okay, so this equation cannot be easily satisfied if epsilon under tilde is a complex number. So k okay, x, k y, and k z are complex numbers at this point in order for you to satisfy this equation. So this problem is more complicated. So in order to make life simpler, I'm going to assume a simple form. In, assume a simple form that the electric field is just finding the z direction. Okay, instead of solving an arbitrary solution in a conductive medium, I just assume this solution there. Okay, and then you will find that k square is omega square mu epsilon under tilde, which means that k is omega mu under tilde. Okay, so k is a complex number now. It has a real part and it has an imaginary part. Okay. And you can work out the rest of the things for conductive medium. Again, you find that E and K are orthogonal to each other for this particular case, but you also find an interesting relationship that uh, EX and HY is also related with by this intrinsic impedance, except that the intrinsic impedance, the permittivity now is a complex permittivity. So the algebra is homomorphic. I use the word homomorphic because they are all the same structure. They're no more complicated compared to the case of a homogeneous medium. So, so the interesting thing is that uh, when you have this, um, K is omega mu epsilon, and this is omega mu, and then epsilon is epsilon minus j sigma over omega half. So, so we have to take square root of a complex number, and for many of us, that is a piece of cake. But for some of us, we have to scratch our head how to take the square root of a complex number. Okay, I guess all of you know how to do that since you went through uh, taking undergraduate courses in electrical engineering. So, so what happens is that if sigma over omega is much, much larger than epsilon, if sigma over omega is much, much larger than epsilon, then you can see that K You can just drop the epsilon term. And then what you have is that you have omega mu sigma over omega. And then you have to take the square root of j. And then for some of us, we have to scratch our head very hard to take the square root of minus j. Okay. For some of us, it's a piece of cake. So you can think of this in poly coordinate system. So if this is imaginary, this is real minus j is pointing downward. If you take the square root of it, it will be pointing like that. Okay, but with the square root sign somewhere. So if you were to take the square root of this correctly, uh, what you have is that, um, I believe this would be the omega um, mu sigma over two, one minus j. That is, if you take the square root correctly, which means that the k wave number, which is a complex wave number now, you will have a real part and an imaginary part. What does the imaginary part to the complex wave number do to the wave? So the wave is going to propagate in this manner, e to the minus k d. K is now a complex number with a real part and the imaginary part. What does the imaginary part of K do to the propagation of the wave? Yes. Exponential decay. What is the name again, please? Yeah, your name. Logan. Logan, okay. I try to remember that. Okay, so it will give rise to exponential decay. And the decay rate, you can work it out from those things. 
<coughs> and you can get the real part of the imaginary part. You can see that the decay rate, okay, is um, C over delta. And delta is equal to two over omega mu sigma. You can work it out from this number. Okay, that number is called the spin depth. This number is called the spin depth. So just by staring at the formula, you get some insight. All lossy conductive medium attenuates a plane wave, and that plane wave cannot propagate more than this distance, which is called the spin depth. So if you have to talk, talk to your buddy who is doing some service under the ocean in a submarine, you can only talk to him using radio wave. And if you look at the skin depth of the ocean, it has that formula governing the physical law. In order to talk to your buddy in the depth of the ocean, what must you do in order to talk to him? Or her, I don't know. Do women serve in the submarine as much as they do? You? Okay. So if you talk to any of those, and you need to, what what is what is the three parameter that you can do to make delta large so that the electromagnetic wave can propagate long distance? Yes. Very good. If you make the frequency very low, okay, then you can send signals to your body. But the bit rate is very low, unfortunately, because you can only send very low frequency. So you cannot have time for a long chit chat. Okay, you can have to send almost like Morse code in the olden days. Okay, so so you can figure out the frequency. You can figure out the conductivity of the ocean water. You cannot have control of that, and this is what controls induction coping too. At your home, a lot of us cook with induction coker, and there is a radio wave. I think it's probably on the order of megahertz. Okay, and that radio wave dissipates energy into your induction coping, and they are governed by this formula. You can actually decide on what to do to make the skin that big. You can change meal. So if you go to the supermarket and look for the induction cooking pan, you look under the pan and see if they're made for induction cooking. If you buy the wrong way, one, the radio wave just go to the induction cooking. Not that positing any energy. But you pick the right one with the right meal, all the energy is confined to decay in the bottom of the induction cooker. Okay, so these are the two practical usage of this formula. Of course, we were in oil exploring to do something else. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Then we can continue again next time. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, thanks for coming. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank
That's what you're probably yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. 